Welcome to the program. You know, we look at news, views, truths from a decidedly biblical perspective. And most of you are aware that I apprise you as often as I can on issues surrounding the the paranormal, the invasion into your world and the church by the paranormal, by the occult. And you may have already experienced this in your life. For sure you have a loved one who is encountering the paranormal. And the Bible says in 2 Timothy 3 that in the last days, evil will wax worse and worse. And the world of the supernatural or the paranormal is, frankly, it is now normalized. It's even being proselytized. It's blatant. It's in your face. Primetime TV is proud to present the most outrageously dark programming you can possibly imagine. I'll talk a little bit more about that as we move into the program. Primetime TV simply celebrates the Prince of Darkness, but we know that Hollywood has always done that. You can visit any major shopping mall and you'll likely find products and practices for sale that are totally occult-laced witchcraft sold in novelty stores just like junk jewelry used to be sold there. Just a few headlines I have seen here recently I'm going to cite. I saw one that says, Lack of meaning is driving millennial obsession towards witchcraft and astrology. The article I'm reading one paragraph. Some young people reject formal religion simply because they find it boring. They seek experiences that feel fresh and exciting, and religion isn't something that checks that box. The article says, As religion loses its grip on millennials, young people turn to books, magazines, and the internet for ways to explore the human quest for meaning and their own religious-like identity. And then the paragraph concludes, people can entertain any supernatural idea they want to without approval from a religious hierarchy or institution, and this freedom allows them to pursue existential needs in a variety of ways. Well, let me just say here that the variety of ways, they're all very dangerous. Another headline I happen to see says, Witchcraft moves to the mainstream in America as Christianity declines. And I'll read a paragraph. Witchcraft is thriving in the U.S. with an estimated 1.5 million Americans now identifying as witches. As Christianity declines across the country, paganism has swung to the mainstream with witchcraft paraphernalia for sale on every high street and practices normalized across popular culture. The past two years, it has become darkly politicized. And then we have another last one I'm going to zero in on here, and that's an article I saw kind of reviewing the Netflix series. It's called The Sick Twisted Messages in The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina. Now, again, Sabrina, The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina is a Netflix special, TV special. But the article says this, and I'm only reading one paragraph. Aimed at teenagers, the series contains disturbing messages about Satanism and other things. Frankly, folks, the other things I'm leaving out, okay? Here's an in-depth look at the agenda behind The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina. It was released right before Halloween, the most important holiday in satanic circles. The series takes its young viewers into an occult adventure mixed with all kinds of social messages. The viewers are taught the basics of Satanism. In short, the series is the occult elite trying to brainwash children with its agenda. And the article says the chilling adventures of Sabrina could also be described as a, quote, demonic romantic comedy, but it's gone much further. The main premise is custom made to be relatable to teenagers. It is about a 16-year-old girl who goes to a high school, loves her boyfriend, goes out with her friends, but also she's a witch and her family members are proud Satanists. Throughout her infernal adventures, lots of disturbing things things happen and lots of messages are delivered. But the bottom line is that it sells the devil and it glorifies evil. Remember, folks, this is Netflix. It's coming into your living room, your family room. And then the article concludes, to become a witch, Sabrina must go through a dark baptism and give herself to Satan. However, Sabrina has some questions which are used to educate the viewers about 
Satanism. Supporter just wrote me, says, uh, Dear Jan, I'm a youth minister at my local parish, longtime listener. He says, I especially appreciate your nuanced takes on pop culture and how to see the darker influences behind much of our media and working with other young people. I have overheard a lot of excited discussion of a particular video game that is scheduled to come out this year titled Devil May Cry 5. And after doing some research into the nature of the game, I am nothing short of astounded at how brazenly satanic it is. In summary, the game allows children to play as characters who are the children of literal demons as they fight against the game's villain, who just happens to be called the Creator as if the glorification of the Antichrist weren't heavy-handed and shocking enough. Some of the elements of the game suggest the satanic influence goes through all levels, including the music that plays during the mindless violence that happens on the screen. Perhaps most damaging of all is something called the Devil Trigger, which makes the player character invincible and immensely strong while it's being used. Clearly this message that the power of the devil can somehow make anyone stronger flies in the face of all sense and reason. That's from Alex Meron, one of our followers here online. Now, what I want to do is I want to play a quick soundbite here, and it is John Stone Street on hit the program Breakpoint, and I think Stone Street is going to fill in some of the gaps that I have left out here in my introduction. Then I will bring on my two guests for the balance of the hour. Occult spirituality is on the rise, even among Christians. Is it just pop culture, or is it the Prince of Darkness? Well, my guess, it's both. For the Colson Center for Christian Worldview, I'm John Stone Street. This is Breakpoint. Netflix's most talked about new show this fall is The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina. The Sabrina of the title is Sabrina Spellman, a half-witch, half-mortal who's about to celebrate her 16th birthday. On that day, which is, not coincidentally, October 31st, she's expected to undergo what the show calls a dark baptism, in which she would pledge loyalty to Satan. Now, before you're tempted to say, okay, it's just another TV show that's stupid, consider this. According to recent reports, occult ideas and practices are booming in the United States and not just outside the church. A recent Pew Research study found that a large and growing percentage of Americans believe in reincarnation, astrology, psychics, and the presence of spirits in nature. In fact, 6 in 10 Americans accept at least one or more of these beliefs. Shockingly, that number is just as high among self-identified Christians. Even agnostics, over half in fact, have adopted occult ideas, along with the overwhelming majority of those who call themselves spiritual but not religious. The occult's becoming mainstream in this country. At least part of the reason why is how easy easy, user-friendly, and infinitely customizable, the chaotic buffet of beliefs borrowed from Eastern pantheistic faiths and pre-Christian religions is these days. There's no church, no creed, no set of rules. You can pick and choose whatever you like. It's spirituality meets consumerism, and you are the god. Still, there's also an increase of more rigorous disciples of the mystical, those who really identify and practice religions like Wicca. According to new research by Trinity College in Connecticut, Wicca is one of the fastest-growing religions in the country. Between 1990 and 2000, it saw a 40-fold increase in its number of adherents. One and a half million Americans now identify as either Wiccan or Pagan. The web publication Quartzy appropriately described modern witchcraft as the perfect religion for liberal millennials. Wiccans emphasize free thought and the will of the individual, encouraging learning and understanding of the earth and nature, as well as tolerance and the ideals of feminism. It even comes with a cool hashtag, Witches of Instagram. In other words, for most of its adherents, Wicca functions as a spiritual patina on progressive politics, not really a source of supernatural powers. You won't find these witches stirring cauldrons or riding broomsticks, but that doesn't mean there's nothing darker going on. As C.S. Lewis wrote in the preface to the Screwtape Letters, there are two equal and opposite errors we can fall into concerning devils and demons. One is to disbelieve in or disregard their existence, a posture far too common in the Western world. The other is to have an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. This upsurge of occult beliefs and religions in our country, though often political and consumeristic, is still a sign that forces of darkness are at work. For one thing, all false faiths lead people, including people within the church, away from Christ, and that has eternal consequences. And yet for Christians, there's more immediate consequences too. You see, the scriptures are clear. Satan's a defeated foe, put to open shame by the resurrection of Christ. But make no mistake, he's still an active foe, roaming about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. From Acts 19, we learn that the defeated forces of the enemy pose a very real and even sometimes physical threat. Those who don't take that threat seriously may end up like Sceva's seven sons, bleeding naked and running for their lives. 
So not every plastic lawn vampire or self-proclaimed witch is a manifestation of spiritual evil. But the rise of occult beliefs, especially within the church, is making the old call to renounce the devil and all his works even more relevant today than ever. You're listening to Understanding the Times Radio. In case you were wondering, Jan Markell here. Now I want to bring on two of my co-hosts and radio guests for the balance of the hour. Familiar voices of Eric Barger. Eric, thanks for joining me. Great, Jan. Thank you. And Jill Martin Rishi. Jill, thanks for coming in today. Thanks, Jan. I just want to pick up on what John Stone Street said at the end of his little clip there, that there are two possible pitfalls going on here. One is that we disregard anything about the demons and the devil. And secondly, is we have too much interest, which again, a lot of people are doing today, particularly teens and young people. But what I see going on in the church is that I think they're disregarding this topic or they're they're playing it kind of too casually. And as a result, things are slipping into the church. The occult issues are slipping into the people's lives, into their living rooms. We're going to talk a little bit about Sabrina here. And it's because they're disregarding the importance of all of this. Jill, would you agree with me? Absolutely. I think that Second Timothy 3 is a key point here, especially I think we should look at the wording of it because it says, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. And perilous there means fierce or violent and just a, a violent reaction. And that's what we are seeing happening in the world. And the church seems to be either afraid or just reluctant to step forward and in battle like we're supposed to yeah. in Ephesians 6. I know that it's been extremely difficult when you when you bring up the occult, people feel awkward. Maybe there's a, a sense of fear there. I don't know, but it's not, let's say, I don't think on the top five in the priority list. It's just my opinion. Eric, your <laughs> thoughts on the Sabrina Netflix series. Now, I don't know that any of us have sat down and watched it, but I think this is pushing to a new level. And you've been kind of an occult watcher for a lot of years. Not only that, you have a background in rock music where all of the things we're talking about really manifest in a prominent way. But I opened talking about Sabrina, the Netflix series. John Stone Street brings it up right away. And the three of us have been sitting in kind of aghast at what's coming into people's living rooms right now. I've never seen anything that creeped me out as much, that disturbed me as much. Now, I've seen a lot of stuff. Yeah, you have. When I, when I was in the world, and of course, all the research since then, and speaking on this issue and writing on it, as you have and Jill has. Last night, as I was looking at these final notes, I went, this is the creepiest stuff, and this is mainstream, or becoming mainstream. This is pushing the envelope, and the reason it's happening is because people are out there watching it. The scripture is so clear about it. Acts 19, and I appreciate Stone Street bringing that up. Acts 19 is an important passage. Those are believers that came together and openly confessed their evil deeds and burnt their books and, and uh, materials that they had used in the worship of other gods. I think we need to look at our homes and our lives and see what's going on. Jill, you and I both in the last six months have written, and rather extensively, and we'll just dwell on it for minutes here, but we wrote about the Arch of Palmyra turning up in Washington, D.C., and let's just give a little quick history there. The Arch of Palmyra was a part of the Temple of Baal going back several thousand years. It was in Syria. ISIS destroyed the remnants of the Temple of Baal or Baal in 2015. And its history goes back to the Book of Kings, Ahab and Jezebel. But Ahab and Jezebel turned up in Washington, D.C. last late September, the same time that the Kavanaugh hearing controversy was going on. And what was going on in the Temple of Baal several thousand years ago was horrific. And I think there was some issues related to the inauguration or the installation of Judge Kavanaugh, probably related to the left's pushing back on abortion issues while abortion was going on, Temple of Baal. Give me your thoughts on the timing, because the timing was most interesting. Well, my father always used to say that when events come together in a certain way, there may be the smell of sulfur in the air. Mm -hmm. And what was so interesting about the Arch of Palmyra is, first of all, it's linked to Baal, which of course there was a child sacrifice linked to Baal. And then where it was set up, which it literally was like a keyhole. When you look through was. it, you you saw the capital, the United the States capital. Yeah. And so it, there was the actual location of it. And then there was the timing of it. And the timing of it was that it was installed on the 26th of September, 2018. And then the hearings where Christine Ford came against 
Brett Kavanaugh happened on September 27. So someone might say, well, why does that matter? Okay, how is the, the Arch of Bell linked to that? Well, the interesting thing is, is that when you dig into Christine Ford's background, which is kind of a hidden thing on the internet, you really have to search to find what Christine Ford was involved in. And it turns out that for many, many, many years, she has made a career of being involved in the abortion drug. So this is something that is not common knowledge, but when you put it all together, you have the smell of sulfur in the air. Yeah, well, America welcomed this Arch of Baal, this Arch of Palmyra, which was a part of the Temple of Baal, and they celebrated it. Again, as Joel said, the U.S. Capitol building was right in the background. The picture, you have to see the picture to have the full impact. And you know, is it any wonder that the confirmation hearings were just consumed in turmoil? What you've got a literally a satanic remnant of a terrible piece of archaeological history. Now, this isn't just a piece of plastic, folks. The Arch of Palmyra replica is 11 tons. So, I mean, it's a huge piece of whatever that they made it out of. I'm assuming they made it out of um, it was molding. It's molding material that yeah. they used to replicate different yeah. it items. It was a archaeological replica. items. It's a replica. It wasn't. Mm-hmm anything original. It's a replica, but I'm just saying it's not a piece of plastic. No. Let me say while we're talking about this, Jan, your article, Summoning Up Demons, Mm -hmm. which was your email on October 23rd of 18, it's got a picture of the arch in it, but the article is really worth reading. And folks, if you want more information about this kind of thing and about this arch, you need to see Jan's article, Summoning Up Demons. And you just go to olivetreeviews.org, olivetreeviews.org, and then go to e-newsletter. And it was October of 2018. You have to scroll Roll down. I want to reference one more thing, and then let's discuss it when we get back. And as I said in my intro, today you've got shops in our major malls, Mall of America, the various malls around the country, that are dispensing, that are displaying, that are selling items that are simply shocking and stunning. We've got Spencer Gifts in the Chicago Mall has been featuring items for teens, including t-shirts, encouraging them, and written on the t-shirt, the words, Summon Up Demons. They're encouraging kids with the products they're selling in this Spencer Gifts in Chicago uh, to commit literal acts of bloodshed. And so a local pastor intervened, and I saw him online. He went down there. He couldn't believe it, so he had to go see it for himself. He was filmed coming out of the store. He says, quote, we're so close to being Sodom and Gomorrah. We're living in a place where just anything goes. Do whatever you want, whatever you feel. And then he concludes, all I'm going to say is repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Let's just play that little clip. I've always loved witches and wizards. I'm a big Harry Potter fan. So when I heard the words, witch store, I had to go and see what this was. So I headed to New York City's oldest occult store. It's called Enchantments. Once inside, you are surrounded by books, broomsticks, herbs, black cats, everything that you can think of that you would think of when you hear of the word witch. Eros and Medea are staples of the place, so that was something that immediately I felt like I was in a witch and magical store. So I talked to the owner, Stacy Rapp, and she told me a little bit about the store and what it does for the people that visit it. Uh, we sell ingredients, supplies, tools, books. The most common thing would be the spell candles and or the spell kits, which Candle magic is a very easy place to start. And I had to ask about dark magic and evil spells. Because of course, just like everybody just talked about, that is what everybody thinks that this store is about. Bad magic is, or black magic, is magic that intends to do harm to another person. We don't practice any form of black magic. We don't recommend it. People ask about it, we tell them no. But beyond all that is what they're known for, which is their custom carved candles, which are really intricate and are selling all over the world. Okay, folks, this is blatant indoctrination going on at your local mall. Okay, I'm coming back in just a couple of minutes. We're going to continue in part two of my programming. I'm trying to focus again. How is the paranormal invading your life or the life of someone you love a whole lot? They may not be aware of it. You may not be aware of it. My co-hosts and guests today, myself, are just trying to make you aware of some of the issues that you're going to encounter because the devil is alive and well on planet planet earth back in just a minute or two just a quick reminder every saturday morning all understanding the times radio broadcasts are posted to our website 
You can listen to them there at olivetreeviews.org. Every weekend, this program brings you topics not often talked about among Christians. Topics like the one Jan, Jill, and Eric are discussing today are rarely mentioned in mainline Christianity. And yet, these themes will be prominent in the last days. If you're enjoying today's conversation, would you become a financial partner with us? This ministry is listener-supported. We depend on you for financial support. Please write with your tax-deductible gifts to Olive Tree Ministries, Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. Reach us by phone at 763-559-4444. Jan, Jill, and Eric return right after this brief timeout. Thanks for supporting this radio outreach, now heading into its 19th year. There is a common misperception that radio stations actually pay hosts of programs like Understanding the Times Radio, when in fact, programs like this deal with serious weekly radio costs. If you would like to underwrite this program, give us a call Monday through Friday, Central Time, at 763 559 4444 at 763-559-4444 or just give conveniently online at olivetreeviews.org that's olivetreeviews.org you can always drop a tax deductible check to Olive Tree Ministries Box 1452 Maple Grove, Minnesota 55311 that's Box 1452 Maple Grove, Minnesota 55311. Proclaiming both the news and the good news this year. The attempt is made with the idea in mind that we grasp the seriousness of what occultism is. It is something which can enslave the mind and possess the soul. And therefore, the Christian must be aware of it and be prepared to deal with it and that we can find the sources of modern occultism far back in antiquity. It is no accident that the Jews themselves were warned by God in Deuteronomy chapter 18 not to imitate the pagan cultures in the land that God gave them, because if they did, they would receive the same judgment. How the paranormal is gaining interest in America. That's the theme of today's edition of Understanding the Times Radio. If you've just joined us, Jan's meeting this hour with co-hosts Jill Martin Rishi and Eric Barger. Let's return to that conversation. Again, here's Jan Markell. And we're all being acclimated to this in mass. Ideas that used to be considered a cult are now not just being normalized to the general public, but proselytized all over the place to the public in ways that I can only believe because I saw it for myself in 2018, just the level that we're at now. And it's getting to a point where every year we're asking ourselves how much more blatant can this possibly get? Point is the occult is openly fully being sold to the masses now. This is trendy, this is a hip thing to do. It's trendy now. If you've been to a mall lately, which I had to do for that unicorn symbolism report I did a while back. That was the first time I set foot in a mall in years. You will find that there are many boutique stores that carry an occult or witchcraft section in the store now. Of course, they don't call it that. They actually refer to it as being free-spirited or something like that. But you have unoriginal stores everywhere trying to be edgy and cool. Urban Outfitters and Spencers, and they're selling witchcraft books and tools like they're just selling people another t-shirt or bumper sticker. The makeup chain Sephora this year even tried to sell a starter witchcraft kit, but it was poo-pooed. Not, not because it's wrong, by the way, to indoctrinate a bunch of young girls into occult practices that they couldn't possibly understand the ramifications of, but because practitioners of the craft came out and were outraged that the store was attempting to appropriate their traditions. Okay, welcome back. You're listening to Understanding the Times Radio, and in studio with me, Eric Barger, Joel Martin Rishi. Let me just refer to the books they've each written, because I think they're an authority when it comes to the issues of all things dark. The 
fact that the Antichrist system is being prepared for the world and in order for that to happen. Well, he's got some useful idiots out there who are preparing the way and they're preparing the occult way. Obviously, Hollywood is the biggest promoter of all these dark things, but lots of other people are as well. Eric Barger has written the book, Entertaining Spirits Unaware, The End Time Occult Invasion. You can only find it at ericbarger.com. ericbarger.com. Joe Martin Rishi has written a sort of a manual for all things things occult. The Kingdom of the Occult. She is the daughter of Dr. Walter Martin. Find the book at waltermartin.com, waltermartin.com. Don't call us, folks. We're not carrying a lot of products right now, but you can find that at ericbarger.com and waltermartin.com. Eric and Jill indicated that things have been ramped up. We've been talking about that. My sound bites are talking about that. Satan used to be in the shadows. Now he's sort of almost in a spotlight. I never thought I'd live to see the day where that would happen in such a blatant way. Eric, the identity of Satan seems to be changing. It's not subtle anymore. He's almost a hero. Now, he's been a hero to those in the rock music world for probably 40 years, but now he's becoming a hero to everybody. Well, it's mainstream is what's happening, and that had to happen before Antichrist comes. I think all this is just in preparation that the world will be prepared to accept something like Antichrist or someone like Antichrist. It's pretty amazing. And you know, I just thought, if in five years, the three of us are sitting here talking, if we're still on the earth and the rapture hasn't taken place and we're talking about this issue, how can we say it's gotten any darker? Mm-hmm. It's, as, it's so dark True. right now. You wonder where it's going to go. And I thought of your articles and uh, your kind of your byline for the last few months. I never thought I'd see the day. Mm-hmm. And, and really, that's exactly what we're seeing, folks. And if the church doesn't wake up and recognize our responsibility to be a force of good in the world yeah. and an evangelistic force to the lost, I mean, if we don't realize what we're to be doing right now, and we need a wake-up call. Well, the church does need a wake-up call, particularly on this. And Jill, we're going to get into this just a little bit later, but I want to just bring this element in, because when it comes to pushing back against some of the darkness, it seems of all places, the Catholic Church is involved in it. Yeah. Evangelicals are yes. sitting on the sidelines, and I don't get that, but it goes back to the fact that the church is dropping the ball. Evangelical church is dropping the ball. Yes, and it's a puzzling thing when you go to try to find help for people who are demon-possessed and they're coming to you saying, I, I'm having these issues, or they have a close family member who are having, you know, who is having this issue. It is extremely difficult to find anyone. I just tried in the Twin City area a few years ago, and let me tell you, it was impossible. There was no one here I could send them to. But why has the Catholic Church stood up and tackled this? I don't get that. This is something they've done really down through their history, and they Mm -hmm. have a a specific ritual for it. And so they have kept that ritual alive. They've trained priests to deal with this reality Mm -hmm. of demon possession. So it seems to me, when looking at their history, that they have never turned away from the reality of possession, whereas the evangelical church seems to either turn away from it or dismiss it as being extreme. That's what's troubling. Me. Eric, your thought on that? Yeah, evangelicals today. I mean, we're into the seeker sensitive, purpose driven, and you know, true. all that stuff. You know, we've mm-hmm. we've got all these plans that leave the unseemly things like, you know, righteousness. You know, we don't want to talk too much about that. We don't want to talk about holiness. We don't want to talk about anything that has to do with demonic or Satan. We better That's the problem. We better be doing that. I don't think every sermon should be full of it necessarily or should be focused on that. But my gracious, we need all of God's word, just not the stuff that feels good that we have been told will fill the seats up. How often have we talked about that? What you're saying, I think, Eric, is, and Jill too, is there are certain topics. Bible prophecy is one of them. But what we're talking about today is another one that doesn't really fit the agenda quite as well in the evangelical church as, again, as church growth the purpose-driven church growth emphasis, that's where the church is heading today. On the other hand, as I just said, the Catholic Church, for some reason, has stepped up to the plate and is fighting demons while the evangelicals are saying, we're not going to go here. Okay, I think we've probably covered that sufficiently, but that is a sad commentary. Eternity is at stake. It's a very sad commentary. Yeah. I wish I could say that it was different, but it took, you know, like I said, a lot of effort to try to find someone to help 
people. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that that really has changed much. It could be the fact that they just, people don't want to go there. Dealing with demon possession is a very scary thing. Mm -hmm. They are, you know, I never sell Satan short when it comes to intelligence or strategy. And we learn that from how he handled Jesus, what he did with Jesus in his temptation. Satan has a specific strategy. He is highly intelligent. And when Christians are dealing with demons, they come out with things about your background that you may not want others to hear. And it's embarrassing. So there are a lot of things going on in that type of a setting that might cause pastors and others to turn away. A lot of pastors, they're not equipped to deal with this. They certainly weren't equipped in uh, seminary and Bible college in most cases anyway. Those that are equipped to deal with it, you know, it's like they're overrun with needs at this point. So I have the same thing. People write me, I live at such and such or in this community or state. I need help or my friend does or my family member does. And it's the same thing. Where do you send people? We've got people in mental hospitals that are being labeled as mental illness when it possibly could be demon possession. You provided me with a quote, Jill. By the way, you're listening to Understanding the Times Radio. If you're wondering what this strange discussion is all about, it's myself and my two radio co-hosts slash guests for the hour talking about the rise of the paranormal. I bring this up a couple of times a year, if not more, because it is making inroads into your church, into your living room, into your entertainment life. It's not just creeping in. It's absolutely storming in, and you need to be aware of it. Right now, we kind of morphed a little bit into this issue of demon possession. First of all, Jill, if there is a Christian listening out there, they don't need to worry about, can they be demon possessed? I think we need to clarify that. No, there is no evidence in the Bible that Christians can be demon possessed. In fact, going once again to the life of Jesus, Mm -hmm. if you look at how the demons reacted to him, they were terrified. They spent a large part of their time cowering and trying to get away from him, and all he had to do was say one word to them and that was go. So they did not want to be anywhere near him and I just don't see the logic and I don't see any scriptural basis for Christians being demon possessed. God will not share space. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is not going to share space with demons. Fear dwells when people don't know about things, when when there's ignorance about issues and and that's uh, sometimes we open that door with fear and not to uh, possession but you know the devil loves to beat on us loves to uh, try to detract and try to stop us from our mission. And if we're focused on our mission, we'll understand what we need to do at this point in time. But uh, sometimes we open the door just because we don't understand the enemy's uh, devices. Paul says we're never to be unaware of his schemes. Mm -hmm. Jill, you made me aware of this Dr. Stafford Betty. That's the name, Dr. Stafford Betty, professor of religious studies, Cal State University, Bakersfield, and an article entitled The Growing Evidence for Demonic Possession, what should psychiatry's response be? Talk to me a little bit about this. Dr. Betty actually has seen, and if you go into his article a little bit, he talks about how he was visiting with people in institutions and saw things that did not fit into the world of the natural. So in other words, he saw people being picked up and thrown. He saw others speaking languages that they had never learned. And so it triggered something in him and he thought, wait a minute, maybe there is something to the reality of beings that exist. And he's quick to say in his article that, of course, it has absolutely nothing to do with the Bible, nothing to do with Satan or demons, but that these are actually evil spirits on their own. That's their nature, intelligent beings that we cannot sense, he says, with a will of their own who seem to bother or oppress us or in rare cases, possess our bodies outright and with whom we can relate or communicate to in a variety of ways. So here you have a man who is completely secular, wants nothing to do with the spiritual aspect of this, but he has to acknowledge from the evidence evidence that he sees with his own eyes that there is some kind of reality, some kind of being there that is evil. What does he conclude? Well, the the whole point of his article is to try to get other people in the secular world to put aside their prejudice against, you know, based on biblical teachings, put aside that prejudice and go explore this and document the things that are happening so that it can prove that there is something there. So I don't really know how successful he's been at this, but 
Interestingly enough, Dr. Kurt Koch, who dealt with the occult for 40 plus years, he's an incredible resource. And he wrote about this and his work was so well documented from an evidentiary standpoint that he was invited to speak at these conferences for psychiatrists many, many years in a row. So that is a documentation that's out there that obviously Dr. Betty was not familiar with and probably would not accept because Dr. Koch was, you know, a Christian. It's like one of you said to me, when we were doing some prep here is that that people have to be asking questions when 10 men can't seem to hold down a 120 pound woman that there's something very strange and supernatural going on correct yes and my father saw that many times he did he did yes he dealt with those who were demon possessed and it was a very frightening thing he literally saw 10 15 men not able to hold down like a 90 pound woman and he saw a woman talking and her lips don't move but the voice is there talking these are things that are common that you see in exorcisms exorcisms they take sometimes a lot of time Mm -hmm. they take a lot of men because you need the strength and that might be one reason too why churches don't want to go there because of the manpower and the time invested and Jesus Jesus said there are demons that don't come out except by fasting and prayer. Right, right, so right, it could right. be an extended period of time dealing with these beings. But unfortunately, it's growing. It's out there and it's growing and someone needs to step up and handle it. I've said for a long time that uh, a lot of churches don't want to deal with it because it will give them a bad name in the community, believe it or not. Okay. That's a the truth. They just skirt around it because they want a nice tidy, very neat, without any of these uh, the, these exterior things that they, they just would rather not deal with. But I wrote about this in, in my book, uh, Disarming the Powers of Darkness. And Jan, when you interviewed me about that book mm-hmm. some years ago now, I remember I stayed away from the stories about that I've had personal experience with deliverance sessions and seeing the demonic and what they can do up close and personal. I'll tell you, if you've ever been involved with anything like that, if you've ever seen it, trying to help somebody be free... You, you never forget it. One of these I'm thinking about was at least 30 years ago, and it's still just as real as if it just yeah, happened this week. I'm sure. A lot of folks in churches just don't want to deal with it, haven't thought about it. It's not been talked about from the pulpit, so they think it's no big deal. But we have a lot of people running around in this culture, and there's going to be more because of this open influence of occultism and supernaturalism that's coming at people. Well, I recently did a program with Steve Bankars, and he was a New Age guru, and one of the best and one of the richest as a very young man. And we talked at at that time about some of the things creeping into the church. And we talked that that in that program, that's I think two weeks ago now, we talked about Christ alignment, which is Christianizing tarot cards. So I don't want to revisit that. But then I also made a reference to Stephen about the fact, you know, that we have Christianized Ouija boards now. I want to play just a little clip here. Christianized Ouija boards are called angel boards. So this is how the enemy is creeping into, it could be the first Baptist church down the street from you folks, because it's making evil look and sound good. This is what you're seeing before you is an angel board. And this is actually being sold to churches. There are actually churches that are purchasing angel boards essentially the occult has taken over the church it's the same thing as a ouija board guys there's no difference in it except they say you can communicate with your angel yeah you're communicating with the fallen angels and the nephilim the children this angel board which is nothing more than the occult bleeding into our society and into lukewarm christians this right here is your tarot card reading where you can have your cards of Christian cards, angel cards, which are no more than tarot cards, to give you your reading of the day. America, this is what Christianity has become. Did you know 40% of Americans actually meditate a day? 40% when the Bible says to meditate on God's word, not on self. Well, and here again, Eric, we get into what he's referring to at the end of that clip there. Is this contemplative prayer, contemplative prayer going on in, in probably half our churches today think this is just fine. And again, it's a kind of a occultized version of a meditation. Yeah, Satan's got a door for anybody that walk through different doors, mark different yeah. things, but they all lead to the same place. And yeah. that's what we have is just this openness to it. And once again, it comes back to the church not knowing what is going on, not realizing 
realizing and not having the understanding of it. And that's why we do these programs on this every so often. I think that it's important to take a look at Satan's strategy. He is changing how he is approaching this world. We are in the end times. And the very fact that he is changing his strategy should be a big red flag for the church. Think about it. Years ago, Satan was in the shadows. He was hiding in the broom closet, like the witches say. So now he's come out into the open and he's come out blatantly. He's come out in our faces everywhere. Just the arch, you know, the triumphal arch of Baal, you know, the old foe of Jehovah in the Old Testament sitting there, you know, just framing Capitol Hill in America. This is something where you have to look at it as a Christian and say, he is out there. He has changed his tactics. Why? The times are coming to an end. Mm. And Satan is not afraid to step out of the shadows anymore, afraid that he'll turn people away. No, he's changed his strategy and he's become even more aggressive. Well, the kingdom of the Antichrist is being built, folks, and we're here to push back against the darkness. We'll do that as we close off this program in my closing segment coming back in just a minute or two don't go away every fall olive tree ministry sponsors a weekend conference to bring together the best teachers on current events in the bible this saturday event is one of the largest gatherings of its kind in america today save the date september 21 plan to join us at eden prairie minnesota's grace church in the coming weeks and months we'll tell you much more you can get a preliminary look at who will be speaking on September 21st by visiting olivetreeviews.org. For conference information, you can also phone 763-559-4444 or write to Olive Tree Ministries, Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. Please stay with us. Jan and her co-host will be right back. I have watched the tide of our times deteriorate for decades. Some say we are in the time period known as the beginning of sorrows, but that actually comes later in God's clock and calendar. Still without an eternal perspective, people are discouraged today, and that is why Hebrews 10 tells us to encourage one another. Olive Tree Ministries has products that will help you do that. Visit our website, olivetreeviews.org, olivetreeviews.org. We have books and DVDs that are uplifting and that will remind you that the King is coming soon and the darkness will turn to dawn. If you want to stay up to date, also check our daily headlines posted hourly every day. The sons of Issachar in 1 Chronicles 12 were men who understood the times. God wants us to be in the know, up to date, and looking at events that cause us to await his return. You say, now, Billy, do you believe that they were really demons? Yes, I believe that they were real demons in Jesus' day, and I believe they're real demons right now. There is a real devil. There's a real devil in the world now. The Bible teaches it. And we can see evidences of his work everywhere. And all of us that are living the Christian life meet him every day because we're in a conflict, not with flesh and blood, the Bible says, but with spiritual forces, principalities and powers and rulers of the dark places. There is a devil and there are demons. And now with a wrap up of today's discussion on the rise of the paranormal in America, once again, Jan Markell. The satanic display in a town square raising eyebrows and sparking controversy. Some say it's simply a matter of freedom of speech. But others find it offensive, especially because it's placed right next to a nativity scene. Local 10 News reporter Amy Viteri live now in Boca Raton with more. Amy. Well, Victor, here's the source of all that discussion. You can see that giant pentagram right there behind me, actually defaced with spray paint, as you can see there. But that nativity scene you mentioned, that holiday religious display, just a few feet away. And tonight, Boca Raton had their annual holiday street parade. And you can imagine this generated a lot of discussion. They call it the most wonderful time of the year, and for many, it's also the most religious. In Boca Raton, people who gathered to admire the nativity scene in Sanborn Square also saw this, a large pentagram weighing several hundred pounds and causing a clash of public opinion. Okay, welcome back. We're wrapping up an hour. I've got in studio with me Eric Barger, 
and uh, Joel Martin Rishi, and I've referred to their books, and I will one more time, particularly Eric's Entertaining Spirits Unaware, End Time Occult Invasion. You've got to find that at ericbarger.com. And Eric, your newer one, again, on the powers of darkness, the title of that is? Yeah, Disarming the Powers of Darkness, and it really deals with our the path to victory and, and uh, what we need to do to help others. And again, that's ericbarger.com. And then Jill Martin Rishi's Encyclopedia, The Kingdom of the Occult. Uh, Jill is the daughter of Dr. Walter Martin, and you can find that a 700-page book. It's like an encyclopedia, Kingdom of the Occult at waltermartin.com. Remember, the programming is posted to my website every Saturday morning. And if you'd just like it downloaded to a device, sign up for the oneplace.com mobile app, oneplace.com. Otherwise, you can just stream it at olivetreeviews.org, new every Saturday. Saturday morning, olivetreeviews.org. Jill, you run our social media. Jan Markell's Olive Tree Ministries found on Facebook and Olive Tree Men. On Twitter, we have Olive Tree Ministries on Instagram. And you hear the pulse of a lot of people over on social media, a lot of them. And we were talking a little bit off air here about some of the things going on on social media. Let's just talk Reddit for a moment. We're not on that, and, and that's kind of new to me. Talk to me about it. Well, Reddit is, talk about a pulse. It mm-hmm. really is a pulse for millennials. Mm-hmm. A lot of them go there. There are Reddit subgroups. If you're wondering what Reddit is, it's a website. It's a kind of a, a quote unquote news site, but it's also where everyone comments and then they rate each other's comments okay. up or down. And then of course, the most popular topics go to the top with the highest ratings. And then they also created subgroups. So there is a subgroup on the occult and I believe it, the count of membership in it now is at least 400,000 maybe maybe 450,000 members on this Reddit subgroup. So the occult is alive and well in parts of the millennial generation. It's It seems to be the influence, in my opinion, of media like Harry Potter, mm-hmm. entertainment like Harry Potter. Uh, these kids grew up with that. And so now something that was, again, in the shadows is now out there worldwide. All of these things, tarot cards, tea leaves, talking to the dead, you know, that was part of Harry Potter. And you see it now. You are, we are actually seeing the results, Jan. Exactly. We're seeing the results of these entertainment giants and what they preached. And it is affecting culture and it will affect in, in many, many ways a lot of people listening today. Eric, you made me aware of something this morning on Instagram. Yeah, the witches of Instagram. Talk to me about it. The witches of Instagram have 400,000 followers as well. At least in October they did. Pretty amazing. These are just a series, a group of witches that have joined together. And look at the following they've got and the influence. The influence is pretty amazing. And social media, people can decide to be self-styled in their religious beliefs. They can put away all the traditional beliefs and decide to believe what they want to believe. And this is, of course, really fit for the millennials. It's a, it's a trap that, that uh, will really take a lot of them. Well, they are targeting. They're targeting these younger people. They've always done that. And Hollywood does that as well. But they're doing it so successfully. And then the rock music industry does as well. So do these younger people even... And stand a chance today when it comes to the dark issues. It, they're just surrounded by it. Go to a movie, go to a concert. That's what's celebrated. So many of the millennials also have no basis in absolute truth. They weren't raised in church. They don't have any affinity for Christianity. They instead have a distaste for it. And, and so I mean, what hope do they have when that's the direction that their lives are going? So they're open to look for some spiritual experience elsewhere. That's one of the first headlines I read when we opened this program. Lack of meaning is driving millennial obsession toward witchcraft and astrology. And those, some of those kids grew up in Christian homes. I'm sorry, but they did. And they decided to go down a different path. And, you know, how deep they chose to go down, we probably don't know, but some may have gone plenty deep. We were talking a little bit off air, Jill about the irony we were going back to sabrina the netflix program terribly terribly dark the thing that is so amusing in a way and i I say that from an ironic standpoint mainly the irony of god is here you have a program where a lot of money has has obviously been put into it a lot of promotion has been put into it and it's all about satanism it's all about witchcraft and what
what they did is they made a mess of it. So they, the witches do not wish to be associated so with Satan. So there's division. There's the division. Com- division in the community. Right. The yeah. irony of God yeah. is that the, irony. the way that this series is written, the witches are upset because they never want to be associated with Satanists. And the Satanists are upset because what do they have to do with witchcraft? You know, there's different segments of Satanism right now. There's the Satanic Temple who denies that there is a Satan. Then you have the other group of Satanists, Anton LaVey's Satanists, and they're off in a different direction. And you have many, many more groups, and they don't want to be associated with witches, and witches don't want to be associated with them. But what you've got here in this Netflix program yeah. is, oh, they're all working together and they're all part of each other. And so what they've done is reinforce all of these old stereotypes that the witches are trying to get rid of, that the Satanists are trying to get rid of. And I look at that as the irony of God. Of God. I do. You know, another thing about this show I wanted to point out really yeah, quickly is, you know how men today, our men are under attack. Okay. And we saw it with Brett Kavanaugh and we are seeing it in this program too, because there is a quote from one of the witches about this program. And they're basically saying that patriarchal supremacy is everywhere and it's even here in the world of Sabrina the teenage Mm -hmm. witch and these bad men are everywhere and witchcraft fights against them that's another message they're sending there so it's it's a show that has a blended group of messages Mm -hmm. but I love God's irony that he comes in and says okay you know and the whole thing gets all mixed up and everybody's upset with each other and you have division being sown in the world of the occult well, Christians need to unplug from Netflix. That's all I can say. I mean, I don't know if there's a um, sanctified version of Netflix. and Maybe there is. I don't know. But I think you pay for your seduction here. Eric, you made an interesting comment to me. And we know what's going on, particularly in Venezuela. You said hopelessness gives rise to the occult. And the reference here was the fact that Venezuela is literally falling. It's in chaos as we speak. It's in utter chaos. How do you apply that to our topic today? We don't know exactly what's going to happen in the future, obviously. We don't know what will happen with our economy and so on. But when an individual or a culture is hopeless, I believe they go looking for answers. In the case of the millennials and the Generation Z folks, a lot of them just don't have that basis to go back and and look at church that they had as a child or Sunday school they had when they were a young person. They, They don't have that. And so they start looking for things and they look around and there's all kinds of answers that Satan wants to give them. So hopelessness, I believe, whenever a culture goes hopeless, and Venezuela is a great example. Mm -hmm. It was an affluent, rich. We're not talking very long ago. That's right. But now every grave has been robbed. There are cults that have formed around dead gang leaders. You can go online and and watch and see the videos. You can see what their jails look like, what the culture looks like. And I believe that this hopelessness that has invaded that country, uh, that's a microcosm in a terrible way of what the world would look like when hope is gone. Maybe this is why people would be looking for anyone that can give them a solution in the end days as those events that take us up to Antichrist happen. Uh, We live, Gerald, you and I live in a a pretty dark part of the country here. We live in the Twin Cities area of Minnesota. And 